So what we're going to do is we are talking about the case Margo versus Madison, and what's interesting about it is we're doing it in the style of an Ignite talk. So you're going to notice that the slides are going to advance. When we talk about this case, one of the first things we want to do is we want to pay attention to the election, the presidential election of 1800. The Federalists had been in power for a long time, <clears throat> and as a result of the election, the Democratic Republicans were taking over. The Democratic Republican presidential candidate was Thomas Jefferson, John Adams was representing the Federalists, and so what happens is they have to have their election, and they have to decide who's going to become the president. And the way they had been voting for president, they used the Electoral College, but they used it in a different way than we did, whereas whoever got the most votes in the Electoral College got to be president, whoever got the second most votes in the Electoral College got to be vice president. So what happens is if you want to make sure they're both from the same party, you have to make sure one guy gets at least one less vote. As you can see from this chart, the Democratic Republicans messed it up. They had one guy that was supposed to cast one of his votes for not Aaron Burr, who would have been the vice president, and clearly there's a tie. The, the Federalists were able to do it right, one extra random vote for John Jay. And so what happens is the House of Representatives had to decide who would become president, and they all vote individually by one president, by, uh, by state, each state gets one vote. What's really important about this is it illustrates how much friction there was between these two groups. Ultimately, the Democratic Republicans take control of both branches from the Federalists, but the Federalists use the rest of their lame duck session, the rest of the time they have until Jefferson takes over the White House, to appoint more judges to federal positions. So they pass the Federal Judiciary Act of 1801, and they try to cram a whole bunch of Federalist judges in, because remember, those federal, Federalist judges will serve for life. One, of the, one thing that happens is the President signs the commissions, the Senate approves the commissions, and then the Secretary of State has to actually deliver the commissions to the person who will be the new judge. At that time, it was John Marshall, the outgoing Secretary of State. He runs out of time because he has to run around on a horse doing it. William Marbury never gets his commission. But they say it's okay because they're, they're official, they're signed, they just haven't been delivered yet. Marbury's a nice enough guy, he's a, but he's a very active Federalist. He's a wealthy Marylander, if that's what they're called. Um, and he was going to be appointed a Justice of the Peace in Washington, D.C. Thomas Jefferson takes over, he tells his new Secretary of State, um, don't deliver any of those commissions, okay? I don't want more Federalist judges that are going to be in those positions forever, we want to repeal those extra positions, um, and so please don't go out and deliver those things. So, um, so William Marbury gets upset, and so he petitions, he petitions directly to the Supreme Court and asks them to issue something that's called a writ of mandamus. In other words, the Supreme Court has to order the Secretary of State to carry out that, um, that duty. So the Supreme Court has to decide, do they have the authority to issue a writ of mandamus? And Marbury says, yes, you do, because the Judiciary Act of 1789 gives you that authority. The Supreme Court is going to look at this and say, we don't know if we have that authority, because original jurisdiction, as listed in Article 3 of the Constitution, says that these are the things we can do, issuing a writ of mandamus is not included in that list. And so the question is, can Congress add more jurisdiction, jurisdictionary powers for the Supreme Court? You have a struggle between Congress and the Constitution. And so the question also becomes, who decides who wins when there's a fight between Congress and the Constitution? Well, don't be surprised, Marbury has, not Marbury, John Marshall, the new Chief Justice, looks at it this way, three questions. Did Marbury have a right to the commission? Do the laws of the country give him a legal remedy? And is the Supreme Court um, the proper body to issue this writ of mandamus? He says, yes, he has a legal right to the commission. It was signed by the President, it was approved by the Senate. Yes, the laws of the country give him a legal remedy. If not, society's going to break down. You have to, if someone has been wronged, they have to have a, a sort of a remedy, a, a right to ask for help. Is the Supreme Court issuing a writ of mandamus the correct legal remedy? Yes, a writ of mandamus would be correct, but the Supreme Court doesn't have the jurisdiction to do this. It should be the responsibility of a lower court to, to carry out issuing a writ of mandamus to order them to deliver it. He says that that section of the Judiciary Act of 1789 was unconstitutional. Congress is getting more power than what the Constitution says it should have. If there's a conflict, he decides, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court decides, the Supreme Court chooses a winner, of course. What happens to William Marbury? He never reapplies, he never repetitions for a writ of mandamus in the lower court, but his house later becomes the U.S. Embassy for the Ukraine, which is great if you're from 
the Ukraine. I don't know why else you would care. Why do we care about this case? Because this is the first, this is the main example that is cited as an example of judicial review um, of a uh, case being that. So what you would need to know is Marbury versus Madison, judicial review. Sick. Hey!